uh, some years ago I collaborated with mechanical engineers, so we have a publication. There is an entire page of differential equations, none of which I understand. And I'm hoping to get out of this two pages of differential equations, none of which I do understand there. I work in sensory physiology. And that means that we're interested in how the brain helps us perceive the world. We study vision, as you're part of the Bible Vision Group at Monash. Uh, we, but in my life, primarily the things we study are touch and hearing. And it's in the context of hearing that Iris is going to be talking about. When we look at any of our sensory systems, what they do is take the complex world that we perceive and at the level of the eye or the ear, decompose it into the most elemental forms. So you look at what the cells in the retina are telling you about the world, they're not telling you about the complex image. All they're telling you about is how much light is there in one particular spot versus how much is there around. In the case of hearing, when you hear things, what the ear does is effectively a Fourier transform. It's broken it up into its simple elemental frequencies. Ultimately, of course, we don't hear it as a piecemeal view of the world. We hear it all as a concrete holistic thing. And that occurs because the cells in the brain put it all back together. Unfortunately, that's where the complexity lies because for years, people studying sensory systems have used the model of what happens as the periphery to study what happens in the brain. So we use the most simple types of stimuli to understand responses at every step of the cellular system, and it's become very clear that what happens in the brain doesn't simply reflect very simple linear combinations of inputs. We are interested in looking at the complex world, and what we study in the auditory case is vocalizations. How do we understand speech sounds? We use primates, and that's what Iris will be talking about, and so we use the vocalizations of primates, very similar to ours, and we're interested in the notion of pitch. For humans, pitch does more than tell you about the quality of music, it is how we recognize other people's voices. We differentiate different people's voices in this pitch. It's a skill set which is lost when you have a hearing loss. If you have people with cochlear implants in extreme cases of hearing loss, you can recover most forms of speech comprehension except anything which requires the use of pitch. So we're interested in how pitch is encoded in the brain, specifically in complex signals like vocalizations. And so I'll leave it to Iris to tell you about that. Hi, so I'm going to talk to you about something called spectrotemporal receptive field today. So we are doing a more invasive kind of research. So we stick the pain into the brain and we measure the voltage changes. <coughs> um, so traditionally in, neurons, in auditory neuron science, neuron response to pure tones can be assessed and explained by this uh, frequency intensity matrix like this, uh, which is also called the tuning curve. And this is obtained by recording neuronal response to tones of different frequencies at different sound pressure levels. And however, we, when we have a, a slightly more complicated uh, tuning curve like this, we see that this neuron responds to two range of different frequencies. But however, for this frequency range, at this particular amplitude at 60 de decibel, the neuron is getting a kind of surrounding inhibition compared to this frequency range. So in natural world, when we come across natural sounds like these ones showing here, uh, this is a spectrogram breaking down the sound signal into frequent different frequency bands. So we see that the natural sound has all kinds of different frequency played at different intensities. So this simple tuning curve like this can no longer explain the neuronal response to complex sounds like this. And as Ramesh mentioned before, we are interested to study how neurons represent pitch changes. So we take all of the four different vocalization sounds, and for each of them, we shift the pitch of this signal by either half or one semitone up or down along the frequency axis. So we end up with signals that, uh, that the temporal pattern is preserved, but the frequency components of those sounds have been changed. So we are interested to see that when we play different sounds at different, uh, the same sounds at different pitch to the neuron, what the neural response are looking like. So here are four examples of four different neurons and the response to that uh, the same stimulus at different pitches. So in this graph here, at the x axis we have the time, and on the y axis we have different pitch conditions arranged from high pitches to low pitches. 
and each dot here represents one spike, which is the neuron response to the stimulus. And each, um, every blue line here separate different pitch conditions. So every trials in between the blue lines is from uh, one pitch conditions. And each row here is a spike train, which is a uh, neuron's response to that particular sound over time. So we can see that different neurons have different spectral response to different pitch regions, and they all have a different temporal, pro, uh, temporal response to that one, uh, the, that exactly same sound as well. So we are really interested to see if we can find a way to quantify these different temporal and spectral um, profile of that certain neuron. And one way of doing this is calculate something called spectral temporal receptive fields. And this method has been developed over 20 decades ago, and this is a like a standard way of quantifying neuron response to complex sounds. So what the st spectral temporal receptive field is, is basically a linear filter. So when we have the filter like this, when we get and then we get a signal, when we pass a signal through this filter, we can get a re neural response. So how is this spectral temporal receptive field calculated? It's basically by solving a set of linear equations. So we know that if we have the cross correlation matrix representing the uh, correlation between the spike trains and the stimulus amplitude envelope, we can easily get the spectral temporal receptive field this thing by solving this equation. So these two things we already get because we play the sound, we record the response, so we get the cross correlation matrix from the sound and the uh, re response. And uh, by then we can easily get the auto correlation matrix from just just from the sound itself. So we can easily calculate the spectral temporal receptive fields. And what we are trying to do with this spectral temporal receptive fields is that we're trying to s determine if uh, try to determine pitch sele selectivity or pitch sensitivity by looking at these graphs. So we, our hypothesis is that pitch sensitive neurons may have a different spectral temporal receptive field profile compared to those pitch insensitive ones. And we want to take a, this uh, one step further just to predict neuron response based on a set of new stimulus by simply passing through those stimulus to that receptive field. Then we can get a neuron response to that new signal. So here are a couple of uh, four different threads, uh, STRFs we get from four different neurons. So at the y-axis here, we still have time. And it's like, uh, and at the y-axis, we have the different frequency band, which corresponding to the frequency band of the stimulus. So we see that different neurons are activated at different regions. Uh, I should mention that the color bar here indicates the correlation strength between the stimulus and the response. So the hotter the color, the stronger the, response, uh, the, stronger the positive correlation is. So what the first question we want to ask is that how can we quantify and then compare different STRFs? Because we are doing recordings in three different cortical regions, and we wanted to be able to compare if there is any differences in those neurons in those different regions um, to the response, uh, the response to pitch. So we can we try we kind of wanted to find a way that we can group these different spectral temporal receptive fields to, to different types then we can know that in different regions how many different types are there and uh, what's the population percentage of that ty particular type in those different regions and another question we wanted to ask is that how do we validate that the step spectral temporal receptive fields is actually a true representation of the neuron's response to complex sounds? This is also linked to our second application of these STRFs because pre Predicting the neuron response to a stimulus that hasn't been used in the training set to generate the STRF is actually one of the ways to validate it. So people have found that when we have a stimulus and we have this STRF and we got a filtered signal like this, all we need to do is apply it in to a nonlinear function, then we can get the instantaneous firing rate of that particular neuron. And people have found that normally this nonlinear function is just a simple exponential function. However, in our data, most of the like two thirds of the case, we can't really um, get an exponential function out of this data. So what we do is we take the filtered signal here, plot it in the x-axis, and then we plot it against the response recorded for all those different signals. 
So this is a perfect example of what should happen. So as the signal gets stronger, we get increasing firing rates. So and this can be, uh, sorry, oops, this can be uh, beautifully um, plotted, uh, fitted with uh, exponential function. However, most of the case we got a mess like this, where the filter signal is jumping all over the place with different response levels. So one of the things that we are trying to figure out is that maybe the STLF is actually captured all those information we needed. But all we did was to simply take all the frequencies, of all the signal filtered at a different frequency band, and we take a linear sum across all the frequency band. So one thing is that maybe we should just take a linear sum because that thing, that means every frequency band we give it equal weights. So probably we should give different weights at to different frequency band, but we're not sure how to find out about the weights and how to how do we actually put them together. So. People have suggested that maybe we can use covariance analysis on the filter. So we find out which dimension is the one that caused most of the change. We use that as a second filter, and we pass signal to that filter, and then get a response out of that. But we are not so sure how to do that yet. So to sum up, there's two of my questions. First, how do we quantify different STRFs? And second, how do we get this um, information out of the STRFs so that we can um, predict neural response?